This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and thank you for joining me this week as I talk to Wade Muggleton, permaculturist, tree expert, and author of The Orchard Book, a book about incorporating fruit trees into your garden, however big or small your space. Wade is my favourite type of guest in that he's written a book based on 20 years of solid experience and he's busted a few myths along the way, not least the received wisdom around fruit tree pollination. So if you'd like to find out what makes an orchard, when to prune your trees, what type of trees to select, how to underplant your trees, creative tree training, what is a pitcher and what is a checker, then listen on as Wade starts by telling us what exactly is an orchard. Okay, well, um, an orchard is essentially just a piece of ground where fruit trees grow. Um, I think in the in the planning system, if you're trying to save an old orchard from development or something, six trees plus constitutes an orchard. But um, for our purposes, it's just where you grow fruit trees. It could be the corner of your garden, it could be an allotment, it could be a piece of a field. It's just a place where fruit trees grow. It doesn't need to, um, we don't need to be too hung up about a technical definition of it. But uh, it's a nice word, orchard. I always think it's a... It's a sort of word that has uh, promises, you know, what, what might you find in an orchard? So. Yeah, that's very true. And what might you find in an orchard in terms of types of tree? Well, the most common thing in, in Britain, sorry, the most common thing in Britain is the apple. Um, obviously, apple orchards is something that's synonymous, really, with, with British history and culture, and it is the most widely grown and widely eaten top fruit um, in this part of the world but there are other parts of the country where you get plum orchards years ago you would have had a lot more pears that's a fruit that's rather diminished but um, I guess to most people's imagination um, the apple orchards of sort of Kent and Herefordshire and Somerset and places are what what people think of when they think of an orchard. And, And why do we have fewer pears now just out of interest? Yeah, it's just one of those fruits that's fallen from interest massively. In the 1700s, it was the pinnacle of fruit growing if you could grow good pears and and serve them um, to your guests if you were from the sort of higher echelons of society because uh, pears are really difficult as a fruit because you pick them underripe um, and then you store them. And the trick is picking the right moment when they're actually ripe. Um, there's an old joke that there's only 10 minutes in the life of a pear when it's perfectly ripe and that the skill is to know when those 10 minutes are because they're quite easy to spoil so um i think it's probably that apples are much easier to grow and you know it's the ultimate fast food isn't it really an apple you put it in your you know your lunch box or it's sort of food on the go so i think pears are just trickier harder to grow harder to store harder to serve so they've rather fallen from favor in, in our era and from a health perspective of your orchard is it better to grow a mixture of types of tree Yes, but I, I always say that diversity is, is a wonderful thing. So to grow not only lots of different varieties of the same fruit, but also to grow different fruits. I mean, I'm probably uh, somewhat obsessed with apples. So I've got, I've got 106 different varieties of apple and I've got about a dozen pears and probably five or six plums and different varieties of. Um, but certainly in terms of the health of the orchard. And of course, if you grow lots of different ones that blossom and fruit at different times you're spreading the risk you know the great enemy of the fruit grower is late frost so if you've got the same variety that are all in blossom at the same time and you get a late frost it can just wipe your wipe your crop out whereas if you've got ones that blossom over a six seven week period there's a good chance that some of them are going to get away with it so the more variety you have the um the healthier the orchard and the more successful i think you will be in terms of getting a crop but obviously not a commercial crop. You know, my orchard is a, a slightly crazy collection of rare and unusual varieties. It doesn't make any sense from a business point of view. Yeah, and I was thinking about um, how you might set up an orchard. I think probably everybody envisages trees in the middle of a, a field surrounded by grass, which then gets mown maybe once a year or is grazed with sheep. Is that the optimum way to grow fruit trees or are there better things that you can particularly under plant with um well there used to be sort of historic examples of of, of intercropping really there was um, a a time when people grew daffodils in amongst the fruit trees because that gave them a a cash income in sort of february march whereas obviously the main uh, orchard income would be in october november 
And then there was another system in, in the Vale of Evesham in Worcestershire where they used to grow currant bushes between the trees because um, currants are derived from woodland plants, so they're very shade tolerant. Uh, so they don't mind a bit of shade from the fruit trees. So you could have, say, daffodils, currant bushes and fruit trees. So you've got three sort of different crops um, growing together. But most orchards that we see today do have probably sheep grazing underneath um, as a way of managing the grass. So that would be a sort of lamb production and fruit production, dual purpose land use. Um, but on the garden scale, you can do all sorts of things in a sort of permaculture sense. You can grow ground cover plants and um, the sort of you sort of start verging into the forest garden idea then of having a sort of canopy layer and a middle layer and a ground layer and um you know mixing all your plants together in a, in a polyculture so i think there's, there's a sort of distinction between a, fr a few fruit trees in your garden and perhaps something bigger on a field scale and um managing the grass on a field scale can be the biggest problem people think oh an orchard is just about growing fruit trees but when the whole place has turned into waist high grass and you think how on earth am i going <laughs> to get this under control so i did resort in the end to uh, to sheep i've got three sheep and they they do quite a good job of keeping the grass at bay which uh, saves me a lot of work so um yeah you've got to think about how you manage uh, things other than just the trees yeah because i think um talking about a smaller space um I've actually got, I've got a job where I manage. There's um, four fruit trees in a line in a very tiny little area. Uh, and we actually did the no-dig method and got rid of the grass underneath them. Uh, and now we've started to plant various bits and pieces. Uh, but there's three things I always come up against when I'm under planting fruit trees with anything but grass. And that is, how do you avoid dropping fruit, breaking the plants underneath? Um, you know, sometimes it's difficult to weed the trees if they're in full leaf and full fruit. And also, I think sometimes it's difficult to work around underplanting when you're harvesting. So those those would be my three things that I struggle with if I, as I say, if I put anything under fruit trees other than grass. Are there ways around that? Um, I suppose select plants that are a bit rusty tufty and don't mind a bit of, you know, trampling occasionally or, or fruit falling on them. I suppose try and pick as much fruit as possible before it falls because obviously it does um, bruise and won't keep once it's once it's bruised. But um, I guess it's, yeah, I mean, a great thing I think is alpine strawberries for a garden because they just run all over the place um, and they form a, a fantastic ground cover. Um, but other people put herbs uh, around fruit trees, which there's a there's a school of thought that the uh, the aromas given off by the herbs, you know, adds to the health and keeps pests away and things. And some people grow comfrey around fruit trees as a sort of um, chop and chuck because it's mining um, minerals from deep down. And by cutting it and then just mulching it back round, you're sort of enriching the soil from the top. So there's a range of techniques in sort of permaculture. Due to a technical hitch, the recording cut out at my end, but the question I posed to Wade was, how can you keep costs down when establishing an orchard from scratch? Yeah, well, I've got about 120 trees in my collection altogether, and if I had to buy those in at sort of 15, 16 pounds a tree, I couldn't have afforded to do it. So um, I grafted a vast chunk of my own trees, and um, by, <clears throat> by buying the rootstocks and then getting uh, cuttings or scion from other people, I established a whole load of my trees at a pound each. Um, so grafting is one of those things that's a bit shrouded in sort of mystery as if it's some ancient art that's all a bit secretive. But if you can get to go on a course and learn how to do it, it's incredibly satisfying. I've taught a wide range of workshops over the years on it, and I often bump into people and they say, oh, the little tree I did on your course is going great guns. And people find it really satisfying, the idea of creating their own tree. Um, because you only need a rootstock and a, and a cutting off someone else's tree and you can make your own tree. So that's the cheapest way of doing it. I suppose the other the other way to do it is to perhaps wait till the end of the season and often fruit tree nurseries will sell off surplus stock in sort of late March because they don't want to keep it. Um, so, you know, a bit of bargain hunting is the other way to, to perhaps uh, save some money on your establishment costs. And you mentioned in the book overgrafting. What is that? Yeah, overgrafting is something we don't see so much of today, but it's the idea that if you've got a tree, you can actually convert it or turn it into a different variety. So if in the past, for example, you had an orchard full of russets and say the market commercially for russets had sort of died a bit, which, which you did do, you could cut those trees back. So you sort of saw off all the main branches and then you go around and you splice in a whole load of cuttings of a different variety. 
And within two, probably three years, those trees that were once, say, russets will produce a different type of apple altogether. And we can find examples of that in old orchards through talking to sort of a, the old um, orchard men and women of sort of 70, 80 years ago. And they say, oh, yeah, that tree over there used to be such and such. And, you know, my dad grafted it, something else onto it. And so what you're looking at as the trunk of the tree is not the same as the, the fruit being born on the branches. So it is one of those um, sort of quite extraordinary things that you think, oh, that's amazing. You can, it's a bit like transplants, I suppose, isn't it? You chop, chop a piece off one tree and, and transplant it onto another and it grows away. So um, I've got one in my front garden, which used to be an ornamental crab apple. And it's now produces seven different, seven different apples because I've grafted um, different varieties onto different stubs stubs of different branches over the years and it looks quite uh, wacky in october because you've got like light green apples russets red apples scarlet apples all growing on the same tree if you've only got a small space in your garden you know for say one or two trees by having a family tree they call them you can buy them ready done with two or three different ones on um or if you can master the uh, art of grafting you can add extra varieties onto a onto an existing tree so you can have an apple tree that produces several different apples on the same tree Amazing. Oh, yeah, I bet that gets the passers by. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's sort of like a um, sort of traffic light tree with green, yellow, and red apples on it. So. Sounds amazing. Uh, and the other piece of terminology that I wasn't familiar with that you mentioned in the book, and I wondered if you could explain, is pictures. Yes, that's, that's something that's sort of been researched a little bit now. That in, in certain, normally, obviously, the, the thing that a lot of people don't understand about apple trees is that if you take the pips out of an apple and grow them they will grow into an apple tree and it will produce apples but those apples will be different to the one they came out of and that's because they've been cross-pollinated so when the insects turn up in the spring and pollinate your blossom it's 50 percent the tree and it's 50 percent the genetics of whatever the pollen that the insects bring is so therefore when we buy a fruit tree it is grafted because the only way to get a known variety is to propagate it vegetatively so you need a cutting you can't grow apples from seed and get the same apple they came out of um, and the reason we have to graft them is because generally they don't strike from cuttings if you put a piece of willow or poplar or something in the ground it roots and grows away but apples tend not to do that but some research has shown there's a few varieties that will do that so if you if you snap a branch off an apple tree and stick it in as a hardwood cutting a few of them will grow and they're called pitchers because you can supposedly pitch a bit of it anywhere and it'll grow. And um, they seem to exist mostly in the sort of Wales and Ireland and Cornwall, so the sort of extremities of Britain. Um, but they, they, they appear to be very, very hardy trees. And obviously, if you were sort of the rural poor in the past, you could just go around to your neighbour and get an apple tree by snapping a bit off, off their apple tree. So it kind of cut out the whole sort of idea of having to graft and um, nurture trees um, but it's unusual because the generally the apple family won't won't strike on their own roots from cuttings but there's a few uh, that do and they're called pitchers and there's a few people looking into that at the moment there's a sort of it's not sure whether they exist in those places because that's where they hung on whether they were perhaps once more widespread um, or whether they are just suited to the sort of wetter western half of the country but, but yeah pitchers is a bit of an uh, an obscure apple subject that is being looked into a bit now. Mm, I'm t- talking of obscure things to do with orchards. Um, what are checkers? <laughs> checkers, yeah, checkers is is not probably what we would consider a fruit or a fruit tree today, but um, they're basically the fruits or the berries of Sorbus torminalis, which is the wild service tree. Um, so, being a Sorbus, it's related to uh, white beans and rowans. Um, and it's quite a rare tree to find in the wild. It's associated with ancient woodlands. You find it sort of, and never in large numbers. You just find the scattering of them sometimes in certain ancient woodlands. But um, you can obviously get it from a nursery and grow it. So, um, and, and yes, it produces these sort of berries about the size of a cherry. And they were used to make beer in the past, which is why in certain parts of the country you get pubs called the Checkers. Um, you know, the checkers in or something, but also there's a uh, sort of written evidence from sort of late Tudor times of them being um, dried on strings um, as dried fruits, like I suppose the way we would use um, currants or um, sultanas today, and then sort of used as treats for kids or sweets in the winter. So, 
yeah, the checker is a sort of a much forgotten or overlooked um, fruit or berry that we would um, perhaps you know, in past centuries have been harvested. Um, but yeah, so I have got one in in my orchard, uh, a um, a wild service tree. So anyone who's got any in a room, um, grow a grow a checker tree or something a bit unusual that nobody else will have one of. Yeah, that would really that that would be totally different. I was wondering. I learned a lot from your book. I have to say, and um, and I liked your approach to orchards because it, you do seem to trial and error is obviously involved, but you're not afraid to do things, and you've obviously got a, a massive amount of knowledge. And I thought your take on pollination was interesting because we're taught that you need multiple trees from the same pollination group in order to to achieve pollination. Is that completely correct? No, I don't believe that at all, because I think, um, on the one hand, it depends where you live in the country, I suppose. If you lived in the Highlands of Scotland, where there are not many fruit trees, pollination might be more difficult. But if you live in central and southern England, there are fruit trees all over the place. And to suggest that you need to plant two trees next to each other to pollinate each other is a bit of an insult to the insects and the bees, really, who know exactly what they're doing and they'll fly around the district. And if your trees in blossom at the same time as one half a mile away, the bees do so um yeah i don't i don't buy that at all um i think it, it gets tr- it gets sort of trundled out on all these garden programs and things you've got to have two fruit trees no you haven't They'll, the bees are hopping over the garden fences and spreading around the district uh, all the time and i think the other thing to mention about pollination is that the bees get all the publicity but there are all sorts of other insects that do pollination you know, pollen beetles and hoverflies and bumble bumblebees, of course. Um, so pollination is uh, is done by a wide range of insects, which is why the sort of biodiversity crisis and the uh, the demise of insects is such a worrying subject. Because we all need insects to uh, to help us out in our gardens and orchards and uh, do a lot of that valuable work for us. One of the things I've always hankered after is some step over um, fruit apple trees specifically i've seen them at different places and i really really want them um and also one of the other things that you mentioned in the book was fruit tree arches how easy is it to start these things off from scratch Um, and would it be years and years before you saw some sort of results no it, it doesn't necessarily take very long and the thing about young fruit trees is they're incredibly malleable when you've got young sort of trees that are in their first two or three years the branches are incredibly flexible so if you sort of bend them over and tie them to a certain angle they will set like that within a few months and so you can shape fruit trees into all sorts of um, amazing configurations and shapes um, step overs are a sort of it's like an espalier that's only one tier high really and it, it was a victorian idea to sort of decoratively edge vegetable plots and things in large kitchen gardens so you can buy them ready done or you can make your own and to make your own, you just buy a um, a maiden, which is a one-year-old sort of sapling, and you basically behead it at about a foot to 18 inches, which seems a bit brutal when you've just uh, just paid your money for your new tree to chop the top off it. But then the following spring, when it um, puts on buds, you rub them all out except two, so you just encourage you know, by sort of mid to late summer when they're, the wood's starting to harden a bit, you bend them over left and right and tie them down to a cane or a wire and they will set like that so you're you're essentially encouraging two branches one to grow left and one to grow right um and in subsequent years you'll get a lot of vertical growth and what you do every summer is you just keep shortening that back to two or three buds and that forms the spurs along the length of it i've got about seven or eight step overs in my garden and uh, you can get 50 apples off a step over and that's that's a tree that's 18 inches high and maybe five or six feet long. So when people say I haven't got room for a fruit tree, I always say tree is just finding the right one for your situation. Um, and with the arch, I, again in my garden, I just bought a very cheap metal arch from a garden catalogue many years ago, and I planted a, a red eater on one side and a green cooker on the other side. And I trained them up the side of the arch and then bent them over the hoop and tied them in. And um, now I could really unbolt the metal arch and get rid of it, and you'd have a. I have. I would have a living arch of, a, of, of just apple growth. So yeah, well, they're all really flexible. Cordons, espaliers, step overs. Um, you can train them into all sorts of shapes. So you don't need a lot of space for a huge apple tree. You can, you can grow them in all these wonderful trained forms. I suppose for a lot of people, the problem is having somewhere where they know they're going to stay for any amount of time so that they can keep you know invest the time in doing it um but it does sound like an amazing thing to do 
Um, the other thing you mention as well is that you, I think, prune in summer instead of winter. Um, what's the theory behind that? Yeah, it's quite interesting. If you open any book from the sort of 50s, 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, they all say you prune, you prune, for, you prune your apple trees in the winter. But um, there's a much more modern sort of school of thought about, of doing pruning in the summer. Um, there's two types of pruning, really. If you prune in the winter, you, you stimulate quite a lot of growth. And obviously, it is easy to see what you're doing because there's no leaves on the tree. Summer pruning is much harder to see what you're doing because everything's clothed in, in leaves. But the idea of summer pruning is that because the tree is in full leaf and the sap is flowing, that you're sort of shocking the tree a bit. So it then throws a bigger crop of fruit the next year. So the advice I always give to people um, is to winter prune trees until they're as big as you want them to be. Because when they're young, by winter pruning, you're stimulating new vigour and growth. But once they get to um, a size where you don't really want them to get any bigger, if you switch to summer pruning, it reduces the vigour and it, in theory, throws more fruit. Um, so I suppose you could see it as a, well, I suppose pruning in general is, a, is possibly a form of cruelty because you're, you're chopping into the, the living tree. But that's what it does is it shocks the tree into... Um, into throwing more fruit the following year. So all my trained ones, my stepovers, this barliers, cordons and things, I summer prune all of them now. Um, I still do a bit of winter pruning on some of the bigger trees in the orchard um, just because it is really hard to prune bigger trees when they're covered in leaves. But um, neither are wrong, um, but they're, they're sort of for different objectives, really. The winter pruning will, um, you know, encourage more growth on the tree. The summer pruning should, if you get it right mean less growth and more fruit and when you say summer uh, can i just confirm what kind of months you're thinking about yeah so i do it in sort of august probably and what it does is by by all you're doing with summer pruning really is you're giving it a bit of a haircut of this year's growth now because apples and pears don't crop on the new growth you're not wasting any fruit and by taking some of the new growth off you let the sunlight onto the fruit that is on the older wood so in a way, it has the other advantage of helping ripen the fruit. And by reducing the amount of leaf for the last six or eight weeks of the season, you are reducing the vigour a bit because it hasn't got as much uh, leaf area to photosynthesise and, uh, and feed itself. So it does that twofold thing of letting the light onto the fruit and reducing the vigour. And hopefully the shock of the tree will make it throw more fruit the following year. And um, it is very much considered a, a sort of a lot of modern nurseries will absolutely advocate summer pruning now. Also, before I let you go, um, I wondered if you could just share maybe your top types of tree to include if somebody had a smaller space and your top types if they had perhaps a larger garden. Um, I think the thing to think about when you're, when you're selecting what you're going to grow is what do you want to get out of it? Because the general rule is that the, the earlier varieties, the ones that come ready in August or September, don't keep very well. They're beautiful to eat off the tree, but you perhaps don't want loads of them um, because they won't store. Whereas if you want to keep things and stash them away for the winter, you want some varieties that crop later. Um, I think it depends. People often ask me what they should plant, and I say, well, it depends what you like, really, because like beer or wine or something, I suppose everyone has individual palates. But um, I still think most gardens, you can't beat an apple tree. And whether you want something just like Discovery or Worcester Permain that you can eat off the tree for a month, you know, enjoy it and love it, and it's gone for another year, or whether you want to grow something that will keep much, much longer into the winter and store them away. Um, plums are a bit more fickle to grow. They're a bit more disease-prone. Um, and I think people don't eat them like they used to. But I think really, uh, when pressed, I would say every garden should have an apple tree. It's the, the ultimate English thing, isn't it, to have an apple tree in your garden? Thank you to Wade for taking part in the interview. Thanks to you for listening, and I hope you learned loads as I did. Don't forget, if you can, to please rate and review the podcast. It does help other people find it. Up next is Dr Ian Bedford with his Bug of the Week. Often found resting during the day in moist locations under rocks, dead plant material and various nooks and crannies around the garden are the earwigs. These 15mm long shiny brown insects, sporting an impressive pair of pincers on the end of their bodies, are mainly nocturnal scavengers that feed on decaying plant material, carrion and small insects such as aphids. But unfortunately, 
They'll also sometimes feed on the petals of certain plants such as dahlia, chrysanthemum and clematis. Despite having the appearance of an aggressive insect, earwigs are actually quite docile and primarily use their pincers just for defence. Yet unlike most other non-social insects, earwigs dotingly care for their young, carefully protecting their 40 to 50 eggs throughout the winter until they hatch into little white nymphs that they then feed and tend to until they're ready to look after themselves. Knowing this, it may seem sad that earwigs are often controlled when they're damaging flowers in the garden. But this doesn't have to involve killing them, since they can easily be trapped alive if need be by loosely filling a few empty drink bottles with strips of damp paper, then inverting them on bamboo canes amongst the affected plants. The earwigs will then crawl into the bottles when the sun begins to rise and can be collected and relocated accordingly. In fact, besides being just a sporadic plant pest, earwigs contribute greatly to the composting and recycling processes in our gardens, so could be deemed more beneficial than bad. However, centuries ago, during medieval times, earwigs were often feared by people as they were wrongly assumed to be spreading diseases and venomous. In addition, the medieval folk believed that whilst they slept, earwigs would crawl into their ears and begin tunnelling inside their heads. And so this is the reason why they were called earwigs, wig being the old English word for wiggler. And this belief wasn't just here in Britain, since the French named them ear piercers and the Germans ear worms. But was there any truth in this myth? Well, nowadays, we all know that earwigs don't actively search out our ears at night. And even if one did accidentally enter an ear, it certainly wouldn't burrow into our head. But many years ago, our medieval ancestors, who may have slept on a bed of straw on the ground, might well have unwittingly provided earwigs with a couple of safe, moist havens to rest within during the day. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All podcast.